and and he took a picture of it and then and he just sent me the photograph that he took and he said i'm trying to paint trees like that can you tell me how to do it and i thought about it i thought and i thought and i thought i said you know i don't know i don't know how yeah, to do right. it so I, I wrote him back and i said i'm sorry i can't answer the question i said the reason that painting is so valuable to me is that i have absolutely no idea how i did it On a typical day when I get frustrated with the progress in my art, I try to remember it's just always better to measure progress over many days, or months, or better yet, years. Struggle is always part of art making. What also helps me is to think of those who have struggled way, way more than I ever will, but also pulled off making spectacular art. When I get frustrated, I think of one artist in particular, Russell Chatham. I had the good fortune a number of years back to interview him before he passed. Russell's realistic but imagined landscapes take my breath away. But that's just part of the story. In fact, Russell's life of being given a paint box at eight years old by his artist grandfather, eschewing the art world altogether, and then, despite that, becoming one of the most sought after high priced landscape artists is nothing short of extraordinary. Russell was the poster child for finding his way as he went. His attitude and fortitude will inspire you to possibly take a bit more of your art and life into your own hands. It did me. To see Russell's art and links to his website, click on podcasts at arttolife.com. Join me a few years back now when I had the good fortune to sit with Russell in his studio in Inverness, California. Welcome to Art to Light, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making, and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. We're in Inverness now. This is Inverness, California. It's near the ocean. It's just beautiful. It's, uh, you know, this was the subject of a lot of your earlier work. This is where you, where you grew up or, or where your most, a lot of your early work originated. Well, it was, um, actually in, in the very beginning on my mother's side of the family, we had a ranch in the Carmel Valley that we spent our summers on. And that's really where I started to paint, where I learned to paint. What, was this connected to your great grandfather, or to your grandfather? To my grandfather, yeah. That was his where he land, settled. Was that his ranch? Yeah, it was actually his father's father's oh, ranch. Yeah. It came over in about 1860 from like a lot of the people in California, and particularly down around the Monterey area, as just as the same in Marin and Sonoma are Swiss Italian, and they came over in the 1860s. And in my great grandfather's case, or actually great great grandfather's case, he in common with others, went actually went from Switzerland, if you can believe it to Australia, to the gold rush, oh, wow. <laughs> Australian gold rush, and actually found some gold, and came back to San Francisco, and decided to look around and, um, and buy some land and, and start you know, in his case, he was going to have a farm to make cheese, just like they did in Switzerland. And his cousins, the Salminas, who were from the next village over in the mountains there, settled in the Salinas Valley and became lettuce farmers. The ranch was built around 18, the original buildings were built about 1865 and or thereabouts. So when I was growing up in the, uh, during the Second World War, we spent our summers there. And, wow. and so you have to remember that in those times, there was no television, there was no, there was no entertainment you know, <laughs> right. in, the, in the way that we, that we certainly know it now. And I mean, we didn't have a radio that worked. So basically, when my cousin and I, who was my mother's sister's son, whose name is Tom Wood, he lives right over here in Nicasio, and he paints. Too. Yeah, he's an artist, right? Yeah, and um, you know when when I was, I think I was, we were a year apart. He's a year younger, so I think I must have been eight, and he was seven, 
and they, you know, they basically, his mother and father, who were both painters, mm -hmm. you know, s said it's time for you guys to paint. <laughs> You know, here's your paints. Just set, set you up? Wow. So and we each had a little sketch box. Oh, my God. And, uh, in fact, I have mine right over here. I'll show it to you. And, you know, they showed us how to put the paint out and the brush. Were, were you, like, 14 kind of thing? I mean, was it? were you really young kids? No, I was eight, and my cousin was seven. So you started yeah. when you were an eight years and old we had out a, in that landscape? Yeah, my, wow. so my grandfather died when I was five, so it was 1945. So oh. we started painting in 1947. And he had a sketching umbrella, which was a big silk umbrella that so you carry that with you when you walked out. So if you had to sit in the sun, which usually you did, right. you can't paint in the sun. So we stick the umbrella in a gopher hole <laughs> and it was big enough <laughs> for my cousin and I to both sit under it. And you get this silk light. It was almost like being in a foggy day. You get this yes, beautiful right. diffused opal, light. Right, right, right. And then, you know, we had our brushes and our turpentine, our rag, and we sat in the ground and painted every day. And then, you know, what else? The other thing we could do is play in the creek. You know, so you did two two pretty good activities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, those are still pretty good, actually. Playing <laughs> in creeks and painting. <laughs> but anyway, it's something that... Um, well, for, for instance, my, my two sisters and my brother, I mean, all the kids w were, were kind of sort of encouraged to paint. And they did a little bit when they were really young, but they didn't have it. It didn't mean anything to them. And so they never did it. Yeah. But you After, kept going, obviously. Whatever it was that was, was for me, that's just what I did all through school, after wow. school, wow. you know, grammar school. When, and then, when did it click that this was something you were going to, you know, keep doing? And Well, I knew, I always knew I was going to keep doing it, but I just didn't, I didn't understand it or realize or, or think about it in terms of a profession. By the time I got to be, say, 18, and my father, <laughs> who was just he, you know, he would say, you know, what, what do you, you know, what are you what, going to do? You can't just keep fooling around, fishing and painting. He said, this is, this is, you know, and so, but I didn't know what I, I, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I, I, not, not a clue. So, and I never thought about, you know, painting as a, as a profession or a business, unquote. Then I took a couple of classes at the College of Marin, which, of course, is ludicrous in hindsight because I was the worst student. <laughs> you know, I flunked out of high school. What am I doing at the College of Marin? So naturally, I flunked out of there, too, the first year. Oh but God. I met a woman who was teaching Asian art history and, uh, and printmaking and uh, drawing. And her name was Doris Meyer, and she was a very, very intelligent woman. And we started hanging out together, and I eventually married her. And I, she was like 20 years older than I was. Wow. I well, she, she said to me, why are you wondering what it is you're going to do? He you're says, already doing you're it. You're already doing it for, since you were seven years old. <laughs> um, everything was about your behavior and your, you know, being honest and being uh, um, ethical and all these kinds of considerations was really all that mattered. It was not about what you were going to sell something for. And I, you know, so I tried like all through my 20s, I would have like try to have a little painting exhibition every year. But, you know, it was maybe sold one little painting a year for 25 bucks or something wow. like that. Wow. And I, you know, I thought, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, I mean, but I mean, you know, it's all relative. I mean, sure, sure. And so I just figured, well, so I got to work these crummy, you know, part-time jobs, you know, in the back shop of newspapers or whatever I can, you know, had all kinds of goofy mm -hmm. job, you know, hard mm -hmm. manual mm -hmm. labor jobs and all that kind of stuff. And people say, well, how did you know you were going to, you know, if you became an artist, how, how are you going to live? And I said, well, I, I just assumed I would be poor <laughs> all my life. And I said, if you can't handle that, you know, it's like the old thing. I mean, you can't handle the heat, get out, heat, right, get out right. of the kitchen. And I thought, well, that's too bad. That's just how it is because I'm not doing this for money. Right, right. And right. I wasn't good enough any, you know, at that age, even by the time I was 18. Yeah, I may have painted a thousand sketches, but they weren't any good. Come mm -hmm. on. I mean, you know, they were just ch childish efforts and it took years and years to develop something you know that, yeah. that could be so when did it when did it kind of start clicking that because you 
you actually are brilliant in how you marketed, handled your career and how you've done it. It's really interesting to me. I mean, you kind of didn't necessarily use galleries that much. You, you kind of marketed yourself. You built, you know, you have an incredible reputation. I mean, how did you learn that? I mean, how did you figure that out? I, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I certainly didn't figure it out in my 20s. Okay. And I didn't figure it out in my 30s, really, either. I think I was probably about 40 years old when I started to think, you know, how, you know, maybe this, you know, literally beginning to say, how can I start to actually make a living doing this? Well, it's how you start assessing your value, the tremendous value of your work. And that's just it. That's a pivot for a lot of people. That's really, that's hard. You know, you, you learn, you learn, you learn. And then at some point you have to put a price on it or you have to raise the price or you have to say no to this kind of gallery and not to that one. That's or, very, it's very, really, a, it's a challenging term. Very difficult for me because to put a price on something which didn't, to me, have a monetary value. I mean, and when I say that, what I mean is, you know, we grew up with my grandfather's work. Well, he obviously did sell his work for pretty good prices yeah. when it was sold. Right. But it was never discussed in the family that way. And particularly my my uncle, Philip Wood, Tom's father, who was a very, very intelligent man and discussed art. And he was also a musician. Everything was about your behavior and your you know, being honest and being ethical and all these kinds of considerations was really all that mattered. There isn't any support if your work's not really there no. for gallery. The galleries aren't a good place to turn. In fact, it'll, it'll derail you. So well, it's good it, you got the hell out of it. There. It will, you know, I, I remember talking to a couple of different, one gallery in particular, there, there was, um, uh, because I got a teaching job when I was like 24 years old teaching painting and drawing at the Dominican College in mm -hmm. Santa Fe, yeah. which is absurd, because I was not that much older than the students. But I took it really seriously, and I adopted the classes. I borrowed from my wife what she, what I saw her teaching in her drawing classes, and I said, well, that makes sense. I'll teach these kids that. So I met a, a guy who was a, a Japanese painter named, um, his name was Kishi. I'm trying to think of his first name. He was a professional artist. And he had a gallery in the city, and I went to see the gallery guy that, and he gave me a line of, of BS that I'd never forget as long as I live. You know about, you know not you know you have to do a lot of paintings; they have to all look the same so that people can recognize them at a distance. Yeah. And it's just this, bleh, it's just coming out of his mouth like, and I thought. You are really disgusting, man. <laughs> you know, I said, I said, I, I don't want any part of you or any of your ideas. All right. But still, you know, so I was going to do what I was going to do, but the paintings were not developed. I mean, yeah, right. there's no, there's no kidding yourself about that. You know, and it took a lot of time. And then in 1981, I went to Seattle to learn how to do lithography. And that was a, that was a, a, a very, very strong move on my part for a couple of reasons. And, not, and again, not deliberately, not knowing what I was getting into, because my first wife, Doris, tried to show me printmaking, and I didn't get it, because I, I couldn't adapt what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't take it from painting to, to etching, or from painting to lithography, or to mm -hmm. silkscreen, or whatever. It just, you know, so now, when I was in Seattle, I thought, well, let's try it, you know, and see, maybe, uh, maybe you can do it. Maybe yeah. you can do it. Well, at first, I couldn't do it because I was hooked up with a guy who, with a totally old fashioned uh, place called Stone Press, and the, they were doing lithography on, on, you know, limestone. Oh, wow. Wait, well, there's some problems there. The first problem for me was the image comes out backwards when you print it. I said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make that. And I realized then, to my, sh to my complete shock, I realized that, that professional printmakers, I mean, people like Whistler and Kayo and, and, and Rimrat, they drew backwards. I said, well, I had that right there. I give. Yeah, I, I can't. It's hard <laughs> enough front ways. <laughs> I, mean, I can't. I'm not good. I, I haven't learned how to do it front ways yet. I sure as hell can't do it backwards. And I also realized my grandfather was a great etcher. 
did his etchings backwards. Oh, interesting. And the reason I know that is because I can identify certain subjects, generally speaking, that he that were around where he lived. Oh. And they were then they're and they're flat. They're backwards. There's one in particular of that church in Tiburon up on the hill, which mm -hmm. now is surrounded by oh, houses. Mm -hmm. Well, it was up by itself up there. He's got a painting, a famous painting called The Lone Church. It's up there on the hill all by itself. And he, he did an etching of the path going up to the church in the church with two figures. And it's, it's facing the correct way. So I think, right. shit, he made it backwards. He did it. Wow. You know, and he signed his name in the plate. So he had to sign his name backwards, too. A publisher called me and invited me to Seattle to see if I could make lithographs. And I, I basically said no. But then I agreed to try it, and I, I did three lithographs on stones, and I said, I'm out of here, I don't like this. And the, the other problem, besides the backwards problem, is that it was so costly to do, and the printing was so laborious and slow, that he said, you can have six colors to make these lithographs. That's all I can afford to pay for. Uh. Well, six colors, to me, was black and white. You know, so I said, I, this is just dumb. Well, at the at right at, again, this is this is just a, a an incredible coincidence. This guy named Daniel Smith, who has a big art materials company in Seattle. Right, right, Daniel Smith. He was at that time he didn't have an art materials company. He was a commercial printer, and he was making printing, you know, etching and making etching inks in his garage, and selling them. And he was interested in printmaking, and he was working in a commercial print shop. And at night, when his shift, when it was slow. He would take the plates and make drawings on the plates and print them on the on the motorized press. Oh. Okay, on the offset press. Right, right. So when I told this guy, this publisher, I said I'm not making pr prints anymore. And this guy Dan Smith came to me and said, "Look, you got to try this. This is this is a whole new this is a whole new ball game now." And he talked this guy into buying a big 50 inch single color offset press. He said, "You draw the images on the plates." And you put the plates on the press, the image does not come out in reverse. So suddenly you're it's working off, directly. It's, it's yeah, offset. Right. Okay. And he said, oh, not only that, but because it's so fast, it's still traditional. You're drawing, you know, you're not doing anything photographic or mechanical. You're drawing, but you can use an unlimited number of colors uh, because the cost factor now has dropped to the basement. Mm -hmm. So I thought, all right, you know, I'll try that. So... So I, tr I made two big lithographs. They were like full sheets, which was 35 by, what was it, 35 by 45 inches. And I didn't think they were any good. But the publisher took them to the, some art expo someplace in Los Angeles or New York and sold the edition out in like 15 minutes. I mean, there was three, it was 275 of each one. Oh, my they God. They were gone in a day. Wow. Almost 400 lithographs. Wow. So he came back with his eyes as big as saucers and said, guess Regardless. what, buddy? You're a lithographer now. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, well, I'm not yet. <laughs> not so fast, because I really I, I don't know how to do this. I so... I came up with the idea of doing a series of 12 lithographs called the Missouri Headwaters. Okay, and I said, well, and so, and we made a business plan. He said, well, I'll do them three at a time, and then it'll take a couple of years to do this. And then each, when the first three are done, you take them to sell them to the, this expos or wherever you go. And so we did, went there, worked through the series and sold it all out, right. you know, and suddenly, you know, I realized, you know, I can make a living doing this. Do you think that, I mean, you know, we haven't really talked about it, the subject matter of what you were painting and that transition of studio painting, you know, into studio painting and distilling what you're feeling, what you're thinking out, you know, the essential, just having the essential, you're getting better at that and it's coming out. In the, I mean, that's why they're selling. It's not just because it's a lithograph, it's your work starts to sell Well, as that as you get better at that. And can you speak to what were you figuring out and what are you trying to put in these, in these landscapes that, that imbue them with such strength? I and mean, that's what was happening simultaneously. Here's what happened. Because I was learning lithography 
literally simultaneously with the first time I did successful studio paintings. Well, I realized that in lithography, you couldn't use the same imagery exactly as you could use in a painting because of the, because the, the process is so different. In a painting, you, you start and you, you build it up and so forth. If you make a mistake, which I made plenty of, you paint it out. You either wipe it off right, at the right. end of the day, or if you're stupid enough to let it dry, you paint over it when it's dry or whatever, but you can infinitely change it. Well, in lithography, you can't change anything. So suddenly I realized what that taught me was ah, when you get your yeah. original idea, your, 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 your concept of this thing, and you make that first plan or the first drawing or the key plate or whatever you want to call it, you better make it right. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're cooked. You're learning clarity. You're getting clear yeah. so it, ahead of time. And it made me going to serve your painting. It served my made totally. me. Totally. I said now painting has wow. gotten easier, instantly easier because I'm making less mistakes. I'm now used to not making mistakes. Uh -huh. And it took probably, wow. I'd say it took, I'm going to say ten years, and that's about right. It took a, it took eight or ten years for me to start dreaming in lithography, and. Okay. Then the, the subject matter for lithographs was never the same as it was for a painting because of the fact that there was there were two factors involved. One, absolutely no corrections possible. And number two, the color in a painting, even, with, even if you don't have, make huge corrections, you can always color correct. But in a lithograph, you can't because you're putting down, let's say you're going to put down 35 colors and you go in one at a time over the top of the other. Right. There's a huge potential for failure. Yeah. And I failed many times, right. you know, where you lose, it. you know, it's a, it's gone. I mean, I, I stepped over the line here and, and botched yeah. it and I can't save it. So the whole process of lithography is technically totally different than painting. And so it's like exactly like learning another language. It's like learning French or, you know, right. whatever. But, but I did learn it, but it took, it took a hell of a long time. I mean, like I said, eight or ten years. And then after that, you know, I've done now 150 editions. Nobody's ever done 150 lithograph editions in history. You know, I know how to do lithography right. now. Well, you said then you brought it back to Livingston. You said, didn't you have a whole then I took studio? The, set bought up a press and, and I yeah. bought a building in Livingston and I wow. got the printer and I got did it. And I just worked at it all. And the then time. You're, you're still getting this stream of, of clientele starting to come through, and you can sell these lithographs. And then I had a gallery things. to sell them in. And oh, you started your own gallery. Yeah, absolutely. Right, well, right. yeah, we started out with a gallery that belonged to somebody else, and pretty soon I was 100% of the business. They said, well, it doesn't make any sense to be paying this person 40% commission. Uh -huh. You know, we need to own this building. So we bought it. Wow. And then, I see, I could do lithographs and paint at the same time because I, I you know, draw the lithograph plate, give it to the printer, get, get, and while he was setting the press up and everything, I go back to the studio, which is only a minute away, and start painting. And then he called me and say, I'm ready to show you a proof. Uh -huh. I go back over to the print shop, and it, the proof comes off the press, and I either say it's okay or it's not okay. And if it's okay, then he runs the edition. Or, you know, he runs all mm -hmm, the paper, mm -hmm. gets the color down. Then he's got to clean up the press, do all these things. Yeah, right. And you get to go back and, and I paint. And I go back and, and paint. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's not quite that smooth because the plates have to be drawn. And sometimes they only take half an hour, an hour. Or sometimes they take two days. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly smooth all the time. But it was a, a way to blend the two things. Perfect. You know, yeah. and then the lithographs. You know, the market was, was really good for them. You know, we had dealers all over the country, and there was a lot of money coming in. Yeah, yeah. And Way you, more were, than, you were mostly, it was landscape is what you primarily... It was all, paint. yeah, it was all. The same imagery was, was the same in the sense that it was all landscape. But started from studies that where you'd go out or were you just completely making up landscapes in the end? You know, what was, well, what was your process? I, it's, it's a little bit of each where you see something that sparks an idea. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would maybe make, sometimes I would make drawings, little drawings out outside. And sometimes I would just rely completely on what I remembered. But 
that's the way I, that's the way I was working in the studio too, mm-hmm. you know. And it's I call it working from memory because that's basically what it is. The tone of the work is is really um, it's it's just quiet, melancholy. I mean, is there you know this thing where you're standing in front of it and you say, yeah, that's the right feeling? Or I mean, are you aware of of this that your you know your criteria or your there's such a um, emotion to this work. Do, are you aware of that? I mean, what, how do you evaluate for yourself when a, when a picture is really resonating for, for you when, when you look at them? I mean, they're definitely not all equal. I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes something will develop that, and the, the way I kind of describe it is, is that something comes out of your subconscious, as it were, and works that's I, I, I call that a gift. Yeah. I mean, and and it doesn't happen all the time. You know, usually it's usually, quite frankly, it's just a lot of hard work. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. you just have to show up right. and keep right. keep at it and keep adding and subtracting and correcting. And, then, you know, I, the way I look at it is, you know, working on a, a painting or a lithograph, for that matter, you're you're basically making corrections all the time. Yeah. Fixing, you're getting fixing. rid of what's not working. Exactly, so what you're left with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so sometimes it just works better than others. Mm-hmm. And you know, I don't. I try not to repeat myself, although I have a few times. And, and when I say that, when I say repeat myself, it's like, let's say, you know, I'm I'm really attracted to a you know, late afternoon evening thing with the moon coming up because it's so. It's so fucking beautiful. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, so I painted it a couple of dozen times, but I never did it copying the one before it. If you right, know right, what I mean. came to you and you did it again. Yeah, I mean, you're, it, not, it's, you're not making one offs. I mean, no, not to, no. yeah, right. it's, and they're and they're all different sizes and they're all different moods and different mm-hmm. color, you know, different designs and all that kind of stuff. But it's still the moon coming up, mm-hmm. you know, right, right, and it's a tricky one to pull off because. It's all about emotion and mood. It's all about atmosphere. Yeah. So, and somebody said, you did describe the subject of this painting. I said, it's air. Well, how yeah. do you paint air? There's such a quality in your work. And I, yeah. I, I can't answer, you know. The guy just asked me a question on the internet here. There's a guy who came to the studio is trying to paint. And, and you know, I let him come in here and, and hang for a couple of days. And he was very appreciative and he, he he, he's trying to paint. I, you know, I don't. He's just he'll, struggling. He saw that painting over there mm-hmm. on the, the one in the in the in the box. Yeah. You know, and and he took a picture of it, and then and he just sent me the photograph that he took, and he said, "I'm trying to paint trees like that. How do you? Can you tell me how to do it?" And I thought about it. I thought and I thought. And I thought. I said, "You know, I don't know. I don't know how yeah, to do right. it." So I I wrote him back and I said, "I'm sorry. I can't answer the question." I said, "The reason." That painting is so valuable to me is that I have absolutely no idea how I did it. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I don't. I mean, I do and I don't. If right, you follow right, me, you know. Right. Um, but and I just finished one about a month and a half ago, and it's about maybe four feet square, and it was a subject of that I saw about a year ago, sitting on a patio in Bolinas, looking at Bolinas Ridge, mm-hmm. and we're having a, a like a little luncheon thing, and I was sitting with where I was facing the lagoon and the fog was coming in like it does there off of the channel and going across the, you know, and it was wafting across. It wasn't covering it. It was, you could see through it. Yeah. And I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> that's mean. so anyway, this, this person who was a patron down there, you know, was wanted a painting. And I said, I said, okay, I'm going to, she's, did they possibly do something that has a Bolinas theme? And I said, and I didn't, I wasn't going to do it. And then I thought, yeah, you know, I'll try. Yeah, I will. I said, I'll try that. I said, I said, but I have to tell you, I don't think it's going to work. I said, I think I don't really know how to do it. It's going to be too hard. So I started it and started working on it. And, you know, and it, it, it was hard. But then I hit a point where something happened. And I don't, I, I don't know what it was. It, it was like, I blocked this thing in, and I suddenly, it was almost like like it shouldn't work in the the early stages of blocking in. It should be all mistakes, and it kept like locking in and locking in, and like, I'm going, this can't be. 
I, this, this is, is just working. It's just like it is working. And I kept coming in here and I kept sitting here looking at it. I'm going, I was said I got to be afraid to touch it. And I thought, what, a, what if, you know, well, I said, you know, come on, Russ, you can't screw it up because you've, you're using your own system here, yeah. which is, which is you do something and you let it dry. And then when you come back into it, whatever you put over it, if it doesn't work, you wash it off. Yeah. You can't, can't fall. Lose. Yeah. You can't lose. You can't fall back further than where you started. So what are you afraid of? Just go at it. You know. So I started my own this thing, and it kept getting like it was getting weirded out. It was getting better and better. And finally, I'm just going. I just can't believe this is unbelievable. And I kept fiddling with the light, and and this girl that next door here, um, Gail, that has the produce, is a friend of mine. And I was over there, and she said, what are you working on? I said, you got to come and see this. <laughs> so she came, came over here, and she stood, and she looked at it, and I said, I said, and I wasn't done yet. I said, yeah. I'm going to put make this part in shadow, and I'm going to have this. The sun's going to come across this thing, and it's going to be hitting the, the hill here. And I, I said, and I, and I said, I said, I can't believe I'm saying this because it's too hard, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know? And, wow. And anyway, so... I just kept going, and I finally, when I finished it, I just sat there. I just, I just couldn't believe my eyes. I, said, I cannot believe this. Wow! This is wow. absolutely, you know, I, you know, I started laughing. Actually, I said, it's just, it's just like, just as this, just like, was a landslide from God or something yeah, yeah. that landed on this canvas, and it, it somehow it passed briefly through me. But, right, right. But it, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what a payout. What an amazing... Well, see, but that doesn't happen. I mean, that's like doesn't happen very sure. often. I mean, usually it's more blood, sweat, and tears. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just mm -hmm. tough fight it out and, you know, duke it out to the, get, do the best you can and, and try not to have to throw it away afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. And you do multiple passes on... These are oil paintings on, on linen? Is it stretch linen? Yeah, this is... Yeah, uh -huh. stretch linen, yeah. And um, you just... Come to multiple, are you working on five paintings at once, or you just keep coming into the same Well, I usually, or? you know, the thing is that I usually do have four or five going. There's just that authenticity in the work, and and that might be part of what, I mean, we were talking about the distillation of what people feel. It's just so real. It's just, I Well, I think people, I think people crave authenticity, mm -hmm. yeah. and particularly in our society, and maybe all societies, I don't know, there's not very much of it. No, you know, no. and there certainly isn't much of it in the art world. You mm -hmm. know, when you look at look at the the galleries and stuff, and, you know, especially the the big deal galleries where everything is really expensive. The average person, there's nothing in there for the average person. You know, they don't want the average person in there. <laughs> right, you know, right. The average person doesn't have enough money in their checking account mm -hmm. to be in. The, they. They're set up to intimidate people to get the hell out of there mm -hmm. if you don't happen to have thirty-five thousand dollars to buy a drawing. Right, you know? right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I saw this. Uh, I saw something in the. Uh, I guess it was in the Chronicle. There was this guy Ed Ruscha that's showing at the De Young. You know, it's, I've known him for years. You know, his work is nonsense. Anyway, <laughs> he's, there's a thing on the front page of the Chronicle, and it shows this lithograph. It says it was an ad for uh, whatever the auction house is now. It's not Butterfield and Butterfield, whatever it is, Bonhams or whatever. And it's a lithograph, and it tells it, you know, it's like this big, and it's a fluorescent word that says Annie, like Annie, the cartoon Annie. Right, That's it, right. The word Annie. Right. And underneath it says, expected to sell at auction for $30,000. <laughs> I'm thinking, boy, they have got the golden goose by the ass here, <laughs> you know, because people are actually buying them. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. Well, it's not what it is. It's what people think it is, right? Well, it's, you know, but that's no, part of it. But that's what thing. we're talking right. about here is authenticity, yeah. is perception, is that if, a, if an art dealer can convince, you know, a billionaire that this painting of a blue stripe down the middle that the only problem that artist had was getting the masking tape straight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's worth $25 million. Shit, more power to them. By the time I was 30, it was starting to dawn on me that I'm working my ass off, and I, when am I supposed to paint? When am I supposed to learn how to paint? Mm -hmm. But anyway, so the thing came up about Montana, and I went up there and... Um, to Livingston. To, yeah, to Livingston. Yeah, yeah, my friend Tom McGuane had gone there, and a couple of other friends, 
And I so he says, come up and visit. So I went up there to go fishing and hunting and stuff, and I realized there was this beautiful ranch, you know, next to him. It was a, a six or, 600, six, 700 acre ranch. It was sitting empty, and the guy wanted to rent it, and I went to him and and he wanted five hundred dollars a year, and I said, "That's where we're going. <laughs> That's in our budget." So you get this big studio, and then you start to have the time again. Well, it, the, in other words, because what I did was I told myself right then, and I was thirty-one years old when we went up there. I said, "I don't care." I told my wife Mary, my second wife actually, you know, we're still going to be poor, don't we? <laughs> you know? But at least we'll be in Montana. I have a shotgun, a rifle fishing rods and we have a garden and we can't starve and we won't be evicted because I can make the $500 a year. Oh, wow. So that was, that was the end of the bad job syndrome. And, you know, then in 1974, I sold a book to Doubleday the Publishers in New York, which is a book that's turned out to be a really cult book. It's called The Angler's Coast. And, I, and the editor-in-chief liked the book and wanted me to come to New York. And I said, go to New York. I've never, I can't go to New York. I just don't have any money. I have never been on a plane. I don't know what, you know. Oh my God. And, but I went, you know, because they paid me $3,000 for the advance for this book. Do you know how much money that was to like wow. in 1974 to somebody like me? I said, and I told Mary, I said, we're rich for life. All I really had to go on was which was thank God because my grandfather's a great painter. I had to go on his work, and whatever else that was in the orbit around California. I mean, you were self-taught. That's just so extraordinary. Well, I, you know, yeah. I mean, you looked at these things, but I mean, you didn't. You didn't ever went to art school. You never. Had I had a, my grandfather to lean on. Yeah, and that's why I didn't give up because I knew it's what I was supposed to do, and that's what yeah. I wanted to do. Uh -huh. So I didn't care the rest of it, the career, the money. Well, that, that that didn't exist for me at all. Huh. You know, I said, that's not what it's about. I got my paint box, and I've got this vision that I need to get this. I need to learn how to do this and get it right and get good at it. And But going to New York, I mean, now you've got the, the Metropolitan. You've got the Frick. You know, and I thought then I was smart enough to get on the shuttle and go up to Boston. And look. I walked in there, and I saw that first premiere. Ah, oh, fuck. Yeah. That was really something. But I knew I knew that I wasn't Goya and I wasn't Rembrandt and I wasn't Vermeer. Vermeer, you know. But on the other hand, I did see in the main room at the Frick this huge Corot and I thought, I could go there maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that, that might be doable. I was still painting outside. I hadn't really made the transition yet from sketching, I'd take my car out, my 47 Plymouth, sit on the running board with my box, uh -huh. and go outside and paint. And that's all I really did. And I hadn't made the transition yet into studio. I didn't know what studio painting was. Yeah, and that's what take that and come back in here and hold it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I, that's, I think that was the germ of what I got when I saw those huge paintings in New York. And I realized these are painted, these are imagination. These yeah, are these right. are painting from imagination, you know. And I thought, how do you, how did they do it? I don't know how they did it, you know. And and it was a, a very tricky transition to because when you're outside painting, what's happening is um, you're sketching, you're pulling information in. It's very specific information that's in front of you, and you're pulling it in and putting it on in some form on the on the canvas. And if you're and, and when you're in the studio where you're not looking at, at something in front of you, you have to pull it out of your head. Right. Well, what happens? It gets distorted when it comes out of your head. Mm -hmm. And what, that's what you want, because then then you're pulling out only the essential information. You're getting rid of the meaningless details, you know, right, right. and the and the su total subservience to copying something that's in front of you. And it was that 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 was a very important transition. That and that took years and years and years. So these people started coming to Montana to make movies. Oh right. You know. Jack Nicholson comes to town. Right. Exactly. Ah, and suddenly, I get it. These people were coming to town who had some money and that were that had that were also art collectors, and they'd see a little painting at Tom's house. They said, "Well, geez, that's pretty good. Where'd you get that?" They say, "Well, this guy up the road, you know, paints <laughs> these." They go, "I'd like to get one of those. Where do I find this guy?" And they drive up the road, and there I am in the old 
pigsty, the pig barn with the dirt floor. You know, Selling paintings to Jack Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Wow. So, I mean, it's serendipitous. I mean, because. Like these collectors came to you. Right. In a way. The, the I mean, you put yourself out in the boonies, but it just so happened that was a place that, that was your place ideal clients I needed started to, showing up. I, How do you evaluate for yourself when a, when a picture is really resonating for, for you? When, I mean, they're definitely not all equal. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes something will develop that the, the way I kind of describe it is, is if something comes out of your subconscious, as it were, and works, I call that a gift. Yeah. I mean, and, and it doesn't happen all the time. You know, usually it's, usually, quite frankly, it's just a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you just have to show up right. and keep, right. keep at it and keep adding and subtracting and correcting and then. You know, I, the way I look at it is, you know, working on a, a painting or a lithograph for that matter, you're basically making corrections all the time. You're moved by something. You stand there in a landscape and there's something sparks and then you distill that down. And that's what you've just been doing your whole career. And that's, this is your, purely just your expression. And that's the authenticity. And that's what that's people all, want. That's all it and is. They just crave it. But that's, that's, that's all yeah. it is. And I think... I think that people see, I think people recognize that. I do too. When I was 12 or 13 or 14 years old, I knew that I was going to paint the way I was painting for my whole life. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, I knew that. Wow. And I, I know, but I didn't know it as a, as a job or as a profession or as a, or anything like that. I just knew this is the thing that I really like to do. And I think my grandfather wants me to do this, you know? <laughs> And so I'm going to do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the Art to Life show. If you enjoyed the podcast, please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at art to life underscore world. The recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review and whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning, I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolifepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week.